and welcome to this latest episode of the Driving Their Profit with Zero Emissions podcast. I am Barbara Albert, co-CEO of 100% Renewables, a consultancy specializing in the delivery of net zero strategies. In today's episode, we have the pleasure of speaking with Western Sydney University, a dynamic institution spanning the Western Sydney region, which is home to over 2.5 million people. With 13 campuses and a community of more than 50,000 students and 3,000 staff, WSU has made remarkable strides in just 34 years since its founding. As Australia's 11th largest university by total student enrollment, Western Sydney University stands as a testament to the rapid growth and development of the region. Today, we're excited to delve into Western's strategic commitment to sustainability, reflected in Western's 2021 to 2026 strategic plan, Sustaining Success, placing sustainability at the core of the university's mission. The complementary decadal strategy, Sustainability and Resilience 2030, outlines interdependent priority statements aligned to the SDG targets. And the governance structure has been established to integrate roles across the core functions of curriculum, operations, research and engagement core. In 2021, Western committed to the UN-led Race to Zero for colleges and universities with ambitious targets of carbon neutral 2023 and climate positive 2029. In 2022, Western's efforts across all core functions were recognized through the world's number one ranking in the Times Higher Education Impact Rankings. Joining me today is Dr. Roger Atwater. As Senior Manager Environmental Sustainability in Western's Division of Infrastructure and Commercial, Roger leads his team in overseeing the implementation of the Environmental Sustainability Policy and underpinning the Environmental Sustainability Action Plan and related initiatives, including engagement opportunities through the Living Labs. With honours and master's degrees from the University of Western Australia, as well as a PhD from the Australian National University, Roger brings a wealth of expertise to his role. His early career included work with landcare and integrated catchment management in Western Australia, as well as PhD field work in Thailand. Later, he worked with Western Centre for Integrated Catchment Management, served as a guest professor in the People's Republic of China, and worked on a project with the Blue Mountains World Heritage Institute. Richard resides in the Blue Mountains with his family and is committed to being a systemic practitioner. We're excited to learn more about his work and insights on sustainability at Western Sydney University. Hi, Roger, and welcome to the Driving Net Profit with Zero Emissions show. Hi, Barbara. Great to be here. WSU has been a valued client of ours for a number of years. Roger, just for our listeners, can you briefly tell us about Western Sydney University? Where are you located? How many students do you have? What are your core areas of teaching and research? Sure. Western Sydney Uni has... 13 campuses across Greater Western Sydney and growing. We have over 50,000 students. And this is across many of our traditional campuses, such as Parramatta South, Penrith, Campbelltown, Hawkesbury, and also through our Western Growth Strategy, our vertical CBD campuses, uh, one Parramatta Square, uh, Hassel Street, our Parramatta Engineering Innovation Hub, uh, Liverpool, Bankstown, Westmead, and more to come. Uh, and we've also been very excited recently to uh, uh, be in negotiation with a new campus in Surabaya in Indonesia to complement our current campus in Vietnam. What is your role in the university, Roger? So my team's role is to develop and implement operational sustainability initiatives and link those with broader strategic and core functions or curriculum operations, research and engagement functions uh, across the, the university. 
So you mentioned all your campuses before, uh, all located in Western Sydney. It's certainly one of the fastest growing local government areas in Australia. And this will mean increasing demand for services and education to university level. How is Western changing to meet the growing demand? And what will WSU look like in 30 years? Western continues to be an anchor institute for Western Sydney. And uh, really our principal uh, student draw is to enable communities across Western Sydney uh, from our diverse cultural backgrounds to be able to access tertiary uh, education. And often it's very exciting at our awards and uh, graduations to see families who've never been to a university come through uh, our campuses. And that's a, a value which holds fast for all of us that work here at uh, Western. We are growing. We have a, a strategy called Western Growth, which is expanding and adapting our uses of our uh, traditional campuses and increasing our spread of our vertical uh, CBD campuses, such as Parramatta, Bankstown, Liverpool, Westmead. So we have more highly accessible uh, locations for students to be able to utilise public transport and be able to utilise the facilities, not just with state-of-the-art teaching and learning environments, but also for social learning uh, opportunities, social commons, group learning, individual learning. And our CBD campuses tend to have a high utilisation right, uh, right throughout the day, from early in the morning till late at night. As a, so that's our, our fundamental strategy. We are, of course, increasing our uh, both partnerships and presence overseas, which that's a, a bold new area where we are expanding. Uh, as, as, a, as, as with the, the analogy of a tree, our roots are in Western Sydney and our, our limbs and boughs are throughout the region. And that's what we want to provide for the connectivity throughout the, the uh, Southeast Asian and Asian region and the opportunities here in Western Sydney. Mm, certainly a very exciting growth strategy. And of course, in 30 years time, we will have passed the year 2050, the year by which the world's sustained climate action should have hopefully limited global warming to one and a half degrees. Um, to stay within safe climate level, levels, we need action by governments, by the community and by organizations. Roger, what does showing up for climate action mean for Western? It means making our mitigation and adaptation efforts real for our students, our staff, our communities of Western Sydney. We have fast tracked our efforts and are stepping through our decarbonisation and resilience opportunities now. And we want to be at the forefront working with all of our organizations across western sydney who are similarly working through the challenges of how we take on the the enormous uh, issues around climate change risks and the needs to put in place uh, appropriate practical strategies now it's not something just for the future we're in our knees up to it right now indeed so uh, for our listeners that are listening to the audio version of this podcast, I'm looking at Roger and behind him, I can see a beautiful background picture with a sign saying number one uni in the world with the Times Higher Impact Rankings, Times Higher Education Impact Rankings. So I'd like to mention this massive achievement that Western has made with being number one in the world in the Times higher education impact rankings uh, for your overall actions across the sustainable development goals. What effect has this had internally? Did it validate your broader sustainability response? Does it motivate you to go further? And how does it shape your future strategy? It is certainly a great uh, pride to us all at Western Sydney Uni and our engagement with the Times Higher Ed, even over the previous couple of years, uh, has has shown that we have a very strong and mature 
uh, sustainability focus across all of our core areas, across our curriculum, operations, research, engagement. We have put a lot of collective effort into uh, putting in submissions for Times Higher Ed on all 17 SDGs. Uh, you only need to have a couple plus SDG 7, 17 to uh, for your application. But we find that our broad uh, and collective maturity across all those areas and the implication for the breadth that we can provide for our students is a very important strategy. It's certainly... Achieving First World Wide certainly gives us a great deal of energy to continue our collective actions. Uh, internally, we've redefined our governance structures around sustainability and resilience. Uh, so there are, there's a two-tiered approach across all of our functional areas uh, with working groups and a steering committee leading into our executive. And we already have very strong communication channels around that. And I think that helps us be more strategic in our continued efforts, uh, not just to do the traditional things that universities do in terms of teaching research operations, but to find the, the cutting edge um, opportunities across that. Uh, looking forward more for giving the, the tools to our citizen uh, scientists of our future, uh, in advocacy, in practical strategies, in methodologies, and to be job ready in the, the new emerging areas that um, the climate challenges will demand. Yeah, and uh, talking about emerging areas, Western Sydney is growing rapidly and the Greater Sydney's Commission is driving Australia's first global city region, the six cities region in New South Wales. Within this, the Greater Sydney Region Plan envisages a metropolis of three cities, including the Western Parkland City and the Central City District, which encompasses most of the areas served by Western's campuses. What ambition is there for genuine, sustainable, zero carbon development, also for resilience, which you've mentioned before, and adaptation in these plans? What is your, uh, what is Western's role and participation in this process? Western works through partnerships at all levels of our uh, organisation. Uh, we have our executive uh, uh, involved in conversations at a national level. We have our senior executive involved in governance and, um, uh, and government relationships across Greater Western Sydney and beyond. We work across the mix of characters of our campuses from the urban, the peri-urban and the different cultural and uh, uh, socio-economic situations across inner west, the far west, southwest, northwest. And we work very closely with uh, a range of uh, businesses, local governments, all of us looking towards practical strategies to deal with the, the big picture uh, issues, decarbonisation, climate change risks, water cycle management, biodiversity stewardship, circular economy needs and the connectivities that required at large scales across those areas, uh, and the need to develop those in a manner which is cognizant of and respectful of all of the social perspectives and community needs across our areas and um, the, the uh, given our cultural diversity and the need for uh, recognition and incorporation of Indigenous knowledges moving forward. From our work with you, we know that Western has a lot of learning labs on issues of renewable energy, urban heat, water recycling and peri-urban food systems, amongst others. Can you tell us what are living labs and uh, how do they work? Internationally, there are a broad range of living labs which are very contestable, so you can define them in different ways. Some of the common uh, definitions are that they are looking at issues in a real social context and they engage end, unit, end users in the actual uh, development of solutions. So it has an aspect of co-design involved in it. In a tactical manner, we began to look at uh, small living labs 
by utilization of any of our campus assets, our rich campus assets across all of our campuses for teaching, learning or engagement, uh, that the perspectives needed to be multidisciplinary and draw upon a number of perspectives or tools or, or uh, uh, perspectives. And also that there needed to be a strategic book or a strategic opportunity, which either of those. And that might be a new partnership, a new opportunity for collaborative engagement, a new way of looking at uh, problems. And we are just at a point now where we're starting to try to build on our range of tactical living labs across the area you've mentioned, whether it's uh, wetland performance, uh, biodiversity, conservation, uh, cir uh, circular economy, water recycling, into more strategic uh, areas of living labs. Uh, all of our campus developments and redevelopments are underpinned by an ethos that living labs will be embedded in those. For example, our Warrington uh, redevelopments are looking at a, a Penrith sustainability community as a, the underpinning large scale living lab for that and how that forms. Within our campuses, we're looking at things like smart buildings as a, as a broad strategic living lab, which can integrate many different perspectives with our uh, our different uh, uh, subject matter experts in a number of our areas. So it is a fundamental engagement strategy, particularly for my team as professional staff, wanting to contribute to the ongoing teaching and learning with professional staff, professional practice, providing very good uh, platforms for our students to draw upon. It's such good practice to have uh, uh, such wonderful learning labs. How many of them do you have? At the moment, probably about 20, uh, all reflecting different different characters of our campuses and different uh, interests of, of, of different academic areas. For example, we have one on our Parramatta South Campus, which is looking at an area of historical, uh, natural and cultural heritage, the uh, home of the iconic Parramatta Eels in a corridor right in the middle of the oldest area of development uh, or second oldest only after inner city uh, in Sydney. Uh, electric PV and uh, uh, electrical living labs on Kingswood with our engineering teams a lot of natural resource uh, living labs on our Hawkesbury dealing with water recycling, biodiversity, uh, regenerative agriculture, uh, some being responsive to climate risks, such as our bushfire unit, which is combined across professional staff, and um, a number of others emerging across those areas as well. I want to now drill down a bit into Western's climate mitigation efforts. To set the scene, what are Western's key climate change targets? Our key climate change targets are carbon neutral by 2023, which we've just achieved through uh, Climate Active Certification. Thank you uh, for your help with that, Barbara. And down next is climate positive and nature positive by 2029. Uh, we had initially set in our strategic plan uh, a, a target of 2030, but had put our hands up in the UN-led race to zero to fast track our, uh, our, our targets. What exactly is your interpretation of climate positive? Because we've just um, recently with the release of the ISO net zero guidelines, we now know what net zero means and we know what carbon neutrality means. But what exactly does climate positive mean? What is your interpretation of that? At a very broad level, it means we're capturing more carbon than we are emitting. And uh, preferably with not any offsetting as a transitional arrangement. But it is far more complex than that because carbon neutrality as per Climate Active is a very clear methodology uh, within which you have some scope to adapt to the character of your organisation. For example, we're, we're a, a multi-campus university and that has implications for core categories for ourselves. Moving from that to carbon, uh, to climate positive uh, systems 
is developing a defensive, uh, defensible narrative around metrics which combine other components, where we're combining, to, to quote one of my colleagues, the blue and the green. So we, we've got we're responding to, to climate uh, risks through uh, cooling strategies, water cycle strategies, including biodiversity, stewardship. We are already seeing uh, movements uh, across those, and it's a matter of um, linking both on our campuses and in our regional um, partnerships. For example, we have one with a developing circular uh, economy hub at Hawkesbury, which with Hawkesbury City Council and Sydney Water would be a significant regional circular economy initiative. Those types of regional connections are really part of the narrative and evidence as we move forward as to how we are getting that balance, which is beyond a, a net uh, position. And I think that's very much, it depends upon the context of the organisation as well and your landscape and your assets. So it's very character dependent. So that was looking uh, forward. But if we look backwards, um, how and when did conversations begin in the Western about the need to reduce emissions and how did this evolve to the plans and targets you have today? For some time, we've had the 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 usual suspects in our uh, environmental sustainability uh, expectations, uh, increasing sustainable energy and renewable energy, uh, recycling and moving into circular economy. Um, but I think recently everybody has been galvanised by the continued increasing impacts on Western Sydney of urban heat, uh, of uh, uh, bushfire risks, the flip side of that and our flooding and the impacts uh, of, of on health, on our communities, on our businesses, which has really made everyone recognise that this is not a, a future scenario, that this is reality and Western Sydney is already feeling the brunt of that. So we have recognised that we need to look at larger scale tools and more uh, uh, to, and integrations to, to, to look at that. So decarbonisation has become a key driver. Uh, resilience planning and building upon things like Resilient Sydney and uh, the the reflections upon the the, the 2019 2020 uh, bushfires by the, the chief office of a chief scientist are very very important, and it's really been a coalescing of of numerous tactical initiatives into looking at things through a different lens, particularly resilience, and particularly climate change risks, and that forces you to connect those elements in a, a more critical manner. You mentioned earlier, Roger, about how your execs are all on board with the strategy. So um, can you tell us more about uh, your climate response being senior led and what other internal drivers there were for reducing your emissions? I think we've been very lucky that there has been an alignment of very strong executive commitment, uh, tactical efforts to, to build frameworks which can connect upwards, and also many research, teaching and collaborations to connect outwards. And I think we've been, as a university, we've been actively doing that for quite some time. And this uh, mega challenge which is facing us really needs to fast track and build upon that. Uh, so it's it's a combination of uh, of uh, commitment led uh, and the Indians being aligned and ready 
and the uh, the relationship set up and ready for ready for you know, sort of uh, supercharging as well. Let's look at some of the external factors that influence Western strategy, such as, for instance, what other universities are doing, science-based targets. We mentioned sustainable development goals. So first up, what's happening in your sector? What are the trends and does this influence your strategy? We rely very much on working through our sector networks, uh, particularly reflected through the Australasian campuses towards sustainability, which has been a, a very fundamental forum for a long time. Uh, we have a, a, a small uh, um, uh, innovative research universities network uh, and also the, the government networks such as Sustainability Advantage, which connect us with our, our business uh, interests because we are all able to learn from each other as to uh, the methods and initiatives across the, the, the rapid responses, both organisational and institutional. So that sort of um, being aware of, uh, of what people are doing and how they are doing it and that sort of thing is, is really critical for everyone to move forward. We're, we are well beyond the days of it being a competitive space, it's very much using those networks for the benefit of all and, and taking uh, le lessons learnt from both what people are doing in slightly different organisational contexts. There is also, of course, a very big driver around um, ESG and uh, uh, um, larger sort of portfolios of investments across the world. That is a very big driver all large organisations are open to that. And um, the, the increasing interest in uh, not just uh, climate-based risk dis disclosures, but nature-based risk disclosures and those type of large uh, uh, ESG initiatives are significant drivers uh, globally. Um, and then within the, our, our sectors and our different organisational and landscape contexts, and both looking at the, the, the larger sort of scale drivers of our treasuries and our operational drivers, I think then we look at our own particular character uh, because we cannot immediately pick up something from another organisation and just off the shelf and apply it in our own situation. We have to thoughtfully adapt, build upon, and and trial uh, based upon our own organisational character, our own uh, um, uh, uh, industry uh, sort of uh, platforms of our infrastructure and our people, and uh, then, and I, I fir firmly believe that the character based development in any organization is the most important. That's the that's the engine that responds to all of those external drivers. And um, you know, as I mentioned, our 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 maturity in the, at all of those levels earlier, I think, set the uh well well set us up for starting to fast track our, our immediate responses as many organisations are doing. And we've got to recognise that this is now business as usual for all of us. What's coming through really strongly in your response and what resonates a lot with me is uh, the partnership goal, SDG 17. You, you place a lot of emphasis on that. Can you tell me more about uh, the importance of the Sustainable Development Goals at Western and how they've shaped your operating strategy? Obviously, they are massively important uh, to you. So um, how do they affect you and your teaching and research areas and your future focus? SDGs have really become a fundamental reference set for uh, strategic initiatives, which are put up across the university, must uh, align themselves clearly or state what their alignment is. So it's, it's, it's a high visibility. And there is a very natural mapping of SDGs onto our environmental sustainability action plan and our the, the different uh, usual suspects across our, uh, our uh, uh, environmental sustainability initiatives. Uh, but the most important thing is, is the interaction of those and how 
rather like the, the Stockholm Resilience Institute's wedding cake uh, type of idea that you have our foundational resource ecosystem and ecological SDGs. And then we're, we're building upon that for engaging and, and uh, providing social outcomes in the social uh, and, and community and city SDGs. And the thing holding it together is SDG 17, which is our partnerships, uh, which connect with our ad adaptive management, uh, looking at all of those. And fundamentally to me, collaboration and partnerships, collaboration and partnerships both internally and externally are so critical because we're all learning. It's a social learning context and um, communities of practice, if you look at, at, at a social learning sort of model, are where the, where the learning occurs So and where the rubber hits the road. So if we have more communities of practice and more networks where we are sharing lessons learned across communities of practice, then by definition, there is more social learning. And that's, that's the essential need is to really ramp up our opportunities for collective social learning. Recently, uh, we've received the announcement that finally Western is um, carbon neutral certified under Climate Active. Can you tell us more about um, how you went about this, how you obtained the certification? Very proud of achieving the Climate Active certification. Um, with your help and your colleagues, Barbara, uh, we went through the, the technical steps of the methodology and learnt our way through that, uh, went through our external auditing, uh, our offsetting requirements. And uh, I think we did really well to put in our application. I think it went on in on the 23rd of December last year. <laughs> so we, we, we were, it was, it was great work from, from both our teams working together. And uh, it did take a while to get uh, recognition for that. Uh, and I think that probably just reflects that there are many, many organisations now and, and the, the, the uh, coming on board and becoming climate active accredited, uh, which again, I think is, is so important. Uh, and we've also just gone through with your colleagues our true up process for 2022. Use, uh, we initially used our projections of 21 for 22 and then our true up of a 22. And that is also part of our learning our way through the process because this is the first time of going through the true up and uh, we'll continue to, to go through the process and learn our way through, um, which is uh, now something that... Uh, we have to embed in our increasing reporting requirements as as one of our you know fundamental needs each year. So why did you decide to go carbon neutral? What was the driver behind that? Well, we had a number of tactical discussions, and again, you and your colleagues helped us with some scenario studies around sustainable energy and and possible paths to towards uh, net zero strategies. Uh, and it was great that in our uh, current strategic plan, uh, sustaining success 21 to 26, our executive decided to make sustainability and targets for the achievement in, of renewables in our campus operations and progress towards carbon neutrality, a, a core component of that which was fabulous. Uh, then with the uh, our vice chancellor's commitment to the UN led race to zero in November 21, that really fast tracked uh, our, our work and our expectations. And that put in place our uh, target of carbon neutral 23 and climate positive 29. So university, your key clients are of course your students. What expectations do student, students have in terms of their university being on the path to net zero or having reached carbon neutrality? I think the fundamental thing about student expectations is we must walk the talk. This is not a rhetorical exercise. You have to learn your way through it and do it and communicate that and engage people in the ongoing learnings from that. 
uh, we see from uh, young generations, school children in Australia and across the globe, their expectations and their concerns about climate impacts of a future are very, very strong. And they expect our response and action and outcomes right now. And quite rightly so, quite rightly so. Uh, I think um, we collectively have been sitting back and watching and talking and not doing enough for a long time. And we've given ourselves an enormous challenge even to keep track with, as you say, the the, the targets that were set for uh, uh, climate mitigation uh, only a few years ago. Uh, and we need to be able to do that in a co comprehensive way. Again, it's being uh, thoughtful, ethically defensible strategies across all of our areas of operations. And we're still ha working through a lot of those. We have a lot of work to do, a lot of improvements to do. Uh, and of course, we need to be able to, as an anchor institute, be working at, through our partnerships so the benefits are to our, our communities and the people we work with. And our particular focus, of course, being the university, is preparing our, our students as citizens of the very near future to, to be prepared, to be agile, to have the tools, to understand that the, 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 the ways of looking at scopes of different emissions and those sorts of things. So they are ready to hit the road running as soon as they come out of here to work with organizations like yours, to work in the professional areas of organizations like ours. Um, and also as our role as a university, we must always be challenging ourselves to take a lead, to test, to have those challenges in, in learning through doing and uh, critically uh, sort of, um, communicate what our lessons learned must be. Uh, I think everybody, including our students, very critical of any greenwash. We, we must be honest about our mistakes as well as our, uh, our, uh, the opportunities and outcomes that we wish to uh, uh, you know, seek um, uh, recognition for. Talking more about that with, with greenwashing, there's been a lot of recent attention on greenwashing and offsets particularly attracted a lot of negative attention from the media. What criteria did you bring to your assessment of what carbon credits to buy to reach carbon neutrality? It was a very challenging area for us because we recognise, as, as most do, that any offsetting is only a, a transitional exercise. And in fact, the achievement of carbon neutral isn't the, the best outcome isn't the main outcome of becoming accredited. It's being able to have that baseline of our emission scopes one, two, and three to be able to identify clearly our decarbonisation strategies. And that's what we are doing at the moment with building fairly high level carbon transition plans, the five-year plan, and look at the obvious transitions we need in scope one, two, and three. With our offsets, uh, we, when we were looking at those, uh, we wanted to look at a portfolio approach because it is obvious where, and we hear of, you know, many situations where uh, very smart corporates uh, fall foul of putting all their eggs in one basket. Uh, and also, so and we wanted to be able to learn from that portfolio because it, we, there is obviously a great range of different types of uh, accredited projects out there. We have our Australian and local projects, which are very important. And so within our portfolio approach, we went for a proportion of local nat or national, uh, as I say, uh, being the local ACUs with social co-benefits and also projects in countries who we have teaching and re uh, learning engagements with. And we we're looking for a range of uh, both nature-based solutions and technical solutions, because uh, they have differences in social co-benefits generated 
and also in the economies of scale and and the uh, the the, the uh, generation of credits. And um, we're very proud also that now we're developing our partnership with Indonesia, and um, we have uh, uh, and one of the strong interests in the developing campus areas around sustainability. So. Part of that portfolio was biodiversity conservation in Indonesia with social co-benefits. We also looked at agri-tech and wastewater treatment in Thailand, uh, wind farm generation in China, uh, uh, all of which are very strong platforms uh, that we're working with. And we will be we are working with our treasury team in in our university to look at uh, both how we uh, develop that portfolio, but also coming back to the partnerships, we are developing conversations with partners who we believe have uh, ethical views very aligned to ours as a university, who can help us with that project development, whether it is uh, local to our campuses, regional to great, uh, just outside of Greater Western Sydney, national in terms of uh, across Australia or international uh, because that's our next big challenge and the other side of the coin of, of starting the, the decarbonisation strategy is also and as part of it the climate positive is making sure that we are actively and in a distributed manner contributing to the generation of, of carbon credits biodiversity credits nutrient offsets, these emerging tools, uh, which basically reflect uh, a uh, institutional uh, innovations around ecosystem services. So we're, 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 we're investing in ecosystem services and social co-benefits from, from thereof. I'm very interested to find out more about that. I've got a whole question set on that. But before I go to that question, can I just ask, um, you know, going for climate active carbon neutral certification is such a great achievement, but it's also really, really hard because you have to jump through a lot of hoops and you have to look at not only your scope one and your scope two carbon footprint, you have to do a deep dive into your scope three. Uh, there's lots of things to overcome. What were your particular hurdles that you were facing? And um, and also looking at the hurdles, what would be your recommendations for other companies looking to go down that path? So particular hurdles you've encountered, obstacles, and your advice on how organizations um, can overcome them. Our first general challenge, which we had started to work with for our compliance uh, national greenhouse reporting is, is data stewardship. Uh, gathering data even across scope one and scope two uh, when you're a distributed uh, large organization uh, relies on building significant internal capacities. Uh, we were lucky to establish a data steward whose role was, was just to focus on those sets. And it was very pleasing, at least for initial stage, that when you helped us move into the scope three and the categories of there that uh, as an organization which has fairly well established financial processes, that financial metrics were a suitable first step for many of the supply chain and, um, and similar uh, metrics which we needed to get. Uh, there's certainly a lot of tidying up of those uh, which we, we need to look look into uh, and we continue to try to provide improvements in our uh, data governance uh, which is also very important because as uh, a small team with a data stewardship role you rely upon the owners of the data for the for the quality assurance and the provision in a form which is suitable to our, our, the reporting requirements and that's increasingly difficult when with the uh, range of, of reporting requirements increasing, each, each of them with slightly different uh, defi definitions and criteria uh, and metrics. Uh, so the ability to have a core data set which can be 
interpreted into the multiple different uh, metrics and units and and inclusions or exclusions is 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 a real challenge and i think it, we we have only just started that process of how to improve data collection for some of the areas we we recognize as being very important for for western uh, but which we need far more detailed information for example as a, a distributed campus with staff and students who not, don't just not just from greater western sydney area our staff i live in the blue mountains we have staff on the south coast the central coast uh, many people commute and uh, move between multiple campuses uh we you know we we are moving into more of a hybrid model but even doing that does not dismiss that need because then it is also the resourcing of working from home and it's just it, it just adds to that distributed uh working model so that's really one of our biggest challenges going forward uh and really something we we just need to uh, uh, keep chipping away at and again there 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 are there is no there is no single solution we we decided to try to build inside out with with luckily we found the right people to be a data steward and but we as we develop in more sophistication we're going to have to look for more assistance uh probably not in completely bespoke systems i think moving into this climate data and uh, area it's it's not something which is amenable to a exactly replicable system but I, i'm you know i i could be convinced otherwise um but i hope that there will be more opportunities for different systems um one of the challenges i do find is we we do work a lot through uh, contractors and consultants, and now every consultant pitches what they were probably already doing, with with the 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 underlying motive being net zero. So just sifting through the that that the spin and the rhetoric and looking at okay, what how, which services and what tools really add benefit to the way that we are developing in our own in, internal way is 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 a real challenge uh but we still need to always engage and find out excuse the term who's who in the zoo who who's who's looking at what products who's taking the the the, the path of doing it themselves uh and again fundamentally i think it's back to the partnerships how can you uh, garner uh support from external techs, uh, uh, specialists, and your internal people to build something which has some bespoke elements, some local character elements, something which is right for your type of organisation. And finding that value alignment between your suppliers and yourselves is just crucial. Um, David Carter, the CEO of Austral Fisheries, pointed at us in a previous recording that I did with him that it's crucially important to have this alignment. Now, turning our attention back to biodiversity, um, it's such an important focus for, for Western. There is a lot of development in Western Sydney, which of course affects uh, biodiversity negatively. In December 2022, the United Nations Biodiversity Conference, COP15, ended in Montreal with the commitment to put 30% of the planet 30% of degraded ecosystems under protection by 2030. Now, Western has established a biodiversity stewardship on your uh, stewardship site on your Hawkesbury campus, from which you'll be generating biodiversity credits. What is your view, Roger, on the nature repair market that the Commonwealth Government is currently working on, uh, in which they seek to make it easy for companies and others to invest in nature repair and to drive biodiversity improvements across Australia. When we started looking at biodiversity credits, carbon credits, nutrient offsets, we felt it was very important for us to engage in those emerging institutional arrangements. 
And we are very much watching carefully developments at, at all levels. Uh, I think uh, we're still waiting to see how the um, nature repair market emerges in terms of, of real operations. Uh, but we have been forging ahead with uh, initial partnership with the New South Wales Biodiversity Conservation Trust, establishing our first um, uh, biodiversity stewardship site uh, of 117 hectares. We are now currently assessing uh, another area of over 200 hectares. Uh, and we, we're in a lucky situation where our Hawkesbury campus, which is our best practice uh, peri-urban uh, campus, that we had those assets. And we already had the responsibilities for uh, conservation and protection, but stewardship and the challenging uh, ways of engaging with the markets for uh, uh, biodiversity credits, uh, the emerging markets with, with carbon credits and offsets at the same time, it's all all new territory, you know. For I, I'm only a generalist, but even for our our, our treasury uh, uh, people who are very well versed in in market engagement and all sorts of financial instruments, this this emerging area is is a real opportunity if we can get it right in terms of really accounting for and recognizing and and. Uh, internalizing the value of ecosystem services and uh, and their uh, their immediate not just benefits for us but the absolute necessity you know for our our livability and survivability to to be embedded in in maintaining those ecosystem services we have already uh been investigating uh the emerging areas around nature positive and while we're still trying to work out some of the details we have added nature positive to our climate positive long-term targets for 2029 uh it's been very interesting to hear some of the con conversations through uh sustainability advantage in new south wales where we're seeing uh aligning with climate risk financial disclosures, nature-based financial disclosures, and them being based upon a, a, a robust and pretty well-established framework of ecosystem services. So I, I think having the, the, the federal government move into that space as the state government is, is very good. It's just going to be very complex and very confusing as different tiers of government develop different mechanisms in different manners in uh, that sort of thing. But uh, our approach uh, as a university is, I think it's as a test bed for those, we want to engage with those because you can only learn your way through those sorts of processes like climate active accreditation from the inside out. You've got to be learning by doing. So um, that's that's what we'll be doing, and we'll be very interested to see where the nature repair market goes. How the broader uh, is there broader take up? Uh, what's that balance between regulation, uh, uh, direct reporting, uh, marketing, uh, and um, looking to? Um, uh, uh, investors who who wish to do that uh, uh, you know, as a as a positive and ethical strategy, um, it's 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 going to be a very interesting space moving forward. Do you think, Roger, that there is an intersection between biodiversity schemes and carbon offsets? Yes, I think they're they're critically linked. Absolutely, uh, climate, biodiversity, water cycle management, uh, they are all so integrally linked. Uh, you know, if you look at the the, the impacts on uh, uh, floods and droughts cycles, El Nino, La Nina switches, uh, biodiversity, uh, uh, greenery, uh, uh, vegetation and water as cooling elements, uh, absolutely critically integrated and. Um, our our real challenge is is not just the the remnants, but how to re-embed um, 
vegetation and water sensitive urban design throughout our, our built environment, often having to retrofit systems that are not um, not suited to that. Uh, we um, you know, we hope that there will be there will be a return of things like that the SEP on placemaking, which was looking at canopy cover. Uh, because if I ever, whenever I go into Parramatta, you look out and an established uh, suburb, wonderful canopy cover. Uh, you come back out and drive through Western Sydney, and uh, might be a long way be between seeing reasonable uh, cover. So those are those are particularly important. And then I think we'll also see the natural connection with circularity corporate responsibility which is moving you know, moving forward and I think at the same time where we're seeing in in uh, in in food systems as well uh, consumer expectations and I think um, a lot of it will uh, will be driven by consumer demands um, the real challenges was when you know the situation where we're in now with all the discussion at of the 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 uh, the the budget and and people's responses to fundamental affordability, fun to be, fundamental ability to live in places, ability to provide uh, reasonable cost housing in places like Western Sydney, where it it, it is the uh, most socioeconomically challenged, who often have accessibility accessibility problems, who are most uh, impacted by the health impacts of of heat, humidity, uh, and those sorts of things. So they they all of them connect, but I think it is a natural step to align uh, nature based and climate based. Uh, water cycle folds in directly with the the the, the nature based and water sensitive design, and ultimately our climate positive solutions have to have those and other components linked into them have they have to be integrated solutions indeed so i want to turn our attention back to decarbonization and you mentioned previously that um, going through climate active really allowed you to look into your carbon footprint and you were talking about the difficulties of even um, in calculating your scope one and scope two carbon footprint um, as part of your annual reporting under the National Greenhouse and Energy Reporting System. So what does a carbon footprint of a university look like in an all-encompassing scope one, scope two, scope three? How can people envisage that? But what are the sources of emissions that the university has? In a, in a very generalised sense, our initial cut was scope one, which are our fuels, petrol, diesel, natural gas, refrigerants, about 15%. Our scope two, electricity supply, about uh, 25%. And our supply chain, scope three, about 60%, uh, including our uh, both our goods and services, our, uh, our investment in, in built assets, and and those sorts of areas uh and with our true up um and our changes in an increasing take up of uh renewable green power accredited green power our scope two has uh reduced very significantly uh but we are still looking at strategies for that our uh, a very important strategies that we're looking at is uh, around uh, fuel shifting in our, our away from natural gas and electrification and the challenges of those and and uh, uh, electrification of our vehicles and at the same time our as as and it's understandable that we as an educational uh, organization our product are educational services so our, our upstream supply chains are all the goods and services and materials and buildings to provide those educational services. Um, with our true up uh, that uh, your team has been helping us with, our, our scope three is now 89% of, uh, uh, of our carbon footprint, which really shows the importance. And our colleagues here have already begun the process of um, 
uh, re-engineering our, our procurement processes around that. Uh, and we are looking, we're currently working with uh, uh, Veolia Energy Solutions to for a very high level uh, five-year carbon transition plan, which really looks at um, uh, their expertise in in um, reverse engineering, which uh, is, a, is a term I've, I've heard a lot, but I, I can't say I could explain it to you but working backwards from where we're trying to get to and our assets as we as we know them to look at a what what a cost and program of transitioning away say for example away from natural gas in our central energy plant in our uh, 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 gas powered hvac in our um, gas powered boosters on our solar all of which until a few years ago were very rational, uh, reasonably cost-effective, uh, a better choice than electricity from black coal, uh, but we are being forced to move uh, away from those uh, more quickly, both due to some of our internal targets, which are setting next next benchmarks for us, uh, but also our really trying to move our, our uh, transition plans probably faster than or the choice between what we can fast track and what follows the normal life cycle replacement of uh, large infrastructure through strategic asset planning because we recognize that some things like refrigerants uh, move to new technologies is very very expensive and you can't just uh, for some the, the, there's only limited capacity to to actually recharge with with lower emission refrigerants as we move towards, I think it's uh, methane and CO two, and, and therefore completely different systems. Um, but that's that's our that's our that's been our critical path uh, while we've been waiting for our climate active accreditation is to use our carbon footprint for thinking out. Okay, at a higher level. What are the critical carbon transitions, and what do we need to to uh, uh, seek approval for to actually put in place or fast track programs to move those? Luckily, many of which are already in place. You know, we are already moving towards. We have uh, EV uh, charges on our um, on our campuses, um, and uh, we have some staff and uh, some of our executive also leading the way with uh, personal EV cars. So it's, you know, looking to enable people to to take those personal choices as well as professional choices. Um, and so, yes, it's a very exciting time as to not just the the, the reporting and, and removing through it, but the, the language that the uh, scope one, two, and three provides for us to to look at what those transitions must be and what the options uh, to work across those in a in a uh, strategic and comprehensive manner. I also see that evolving exactly like you said. So companies are starting to dive deeper into the carbon footprints and traditionally um, they have looked at their scope two emissions, um, usually from electricity consumption. And it's fairly simple, fairly simple to to get rid of scope two emissions by switching to green power, and then from there on, you're turning your attention to the scope one emission sources, and that's all the natural gas consumption that happens everywhere, everywhere you just described. That's your fleet, and it's almost like the next frontier of of um, emission sources that have to be attacked. Um, so I talked about making it it's fairly simple as I said to remove scope two emissions by switching to renewables you've recently entered into a renewable energy agreement to supply all of your campuses with renewables of course that didn't happen overnight and I, I made it sound simpler than it is um, there were of course previous efforts to implement this initiative can you tell us more about how this happened well, we traditionally have had two electricity supply contracts, one for large sites and one for small sites, uh, which were working a little bit of out of sync. And 
we had not historically taken up options for uh, direct PPA arrangements with uh, uh, solar uh, providers. And I, I've got to say, I think we just had a bit of good luck that um, uh, green power had matured to a point where for our last large sites, uh, we were able to, to investigation, see that not just transitioning by a, a small proportion or percentage of our supply, but we could go to 100% green power and still uh, save money on our e electricity supply. And then the next step was bringing our small sites into uh, alignment with green power. Uh, so that's a nice step forward. However, we recognise uh, moving forward, there'll be normal exposure to market prices as, as uh, moving forward. We will always be paying network charges and potentially increasing network charges if we rely, rely on external supplies. So, of course, the obvious direction is to look at fast tracking uh, as many universities are doing more local PV generation, uh, battery uh, 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 battery storage, which is now just starting to mature, and looking at the resilience uh, and and aspects like that that more uh, on site generation can can provide and, and uh, resilience from market perturbations, which may may come through for green power as well. You never know. And then, of course, you have put uh, long put uh, attention on having five star and six star green star buildings um, in your portfolio, which is fantastic. And turning our attention to scope threes, do you have um, a strategy mentioned previously? You touched on it, but could you explain that a bit more? Um, how are you um, planning to mitigate emissions in the supply chain and in your wider value chain? Do you have a strategy at this time to reduce emissions? Is there an active supplier engagement process or a sustainable procurement policy, perhaps? Yes, we are. Um, our procurement team is looking at a, a broad ethical procurement re-engineering. So not just for carbon, but also to address the, the emerging multiple objectives of modern slavery, local and, uh, you know, and, and other ethical uh, facets. Um, and so that uh, will be a, a very strong part of that process to really look at um, ways of uh, uh, identifying, you know, not just the simple things of people's information, but... Um, uh, what steps have they made? We we know that uh, uh, a, a good way to address it is if the service industries become climate active certified, and then they have already covered off on their supply chains. We do not need to replicate that. That's that's got to be, I think, going forward, the new version of EMS and ISO 14000 and quality systems and those sorts of accreditations, which were traditionally part of a procurement and contract negotiation. So that pro, uh, that procurement uh, re-engineering is very important, uh, those selection processes. And I think and I hope that there will be an increasing response. We have seen that in, for example, uh, one of our uh, our cleaning suppliers is also just achieved climate active certification, which is great. Um, and um, we hope that more of those service industries occur. Um, for our building stock, uh, uh, especially with our uh, our broad range and uh, continually emerging. Um, uh, new CBD campuses, uh, we recognise that uh, in Climate Active, uh, the embodied carbon itself is not included. And there's a lot of discussion around that. Uh, we've heard that Neighbours is bringing out a, an embodied uh, in a carbon tool soon. Uh, as educational facilities, we don't come in within the Neighbours uh, uh, categories, which, which is a bit curious. Uh, so we tend to 
uh, rely very much, and I think we look to the guidance of GBCA because I think they have clearly indicated that their targets for five-star, green star, and six-star, green star are going to escalate the requirements of, of reduced carbon and decarbonisation in those buildings. Uh, internationally, we see different... Um, uh, mass wood structures and things uh our our strategy is very much to build on the strength we have and we're a leader in applying uh green star buildings in new south wales and only um, behind a couple of other big national um uh, uh you know organizations of similar tertiary style um and also the the we we um are looking at the opportunities with um, Green Star performance because it's not just the iconic buildings, it's helping having the uh, people like the GBCA help us with the metrics to help understand and improve our substantive refurbishments of buildings. Um, you now, we have over 500 buildings across our 13 campuses. Uh, we love our iconic uh, six-star green star ones, and we really love our adaptive reused buildings, but uh, we've got the, the rest of them to think about as well. Uh, and travel and transport is a big one. We have a lot of commuting. We have a lot of transport. Uh, some of that ties back and integrates into our electrification strategies uh, for transport, uh, and um, uh, the location of our campuses and enabling strategies uh, for our staff and students, what they might be in details, we don't know yet. Uh, but they're certainly uh, key areas that we have to work on identifying going forward. Western has an amazing set of climate action initiatives. So I often wonder, how do you gain internal stakeholder support for all of that? That, that, that Can you talk us through that? I think that uh, back to the um, organisational support, all of our executive across all of our areas of, of activity have sustainability and resilience as a, as a core aspect. So the different operational curricula uh, and educational areas all develop different types of tools and tactics, but still consistent with those overall principles. Uh, and so, for example, in our operational area of infrastructure and commercial, um, we have no tr trouble in terms of, we work on what our subject matter expertise is and seeking of course, always appropriate process improvements through engaging organisations like yourselves to help us learn our way through new things and then present that and discuss that both within, within and across our areas. I mentioned that we ha have had for quite some time quite a good uh, sort of means for communication and uh, senior executive patronage across curricular and operational areas, across our, that the core functions of a sustainability universe, university. So if our curriculum operations, research and engagement, we now have clear governance structures. So there are methods and, and, and clear governance and communication up and through and back down to those, those areas. Uh, so it's really just enabling and putting in place those uh, communication and um, and governance structures to enable um, cross-pollination and utilization as platforms and and feeding into opportunities which are emerging uh, and I think that's 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 the next step is really breaking down continuing to break down those traditional boundaries um, you know, it's often said um, universities are the best and worst of a Westminster system in terms of our, our silos, but with uh, citizen science as fundamental to our student uh, uh, learning and and um, and and uh, um, um, attributes, student attributes, research uh, and collaboration, uh, our operational engagements broadly. Uh, I think that sets us up very well to to 
work be working across and uh, tactically and strategically across a large organization so looking at your both your operational and your academic staff how do you think sustainability aligns with their values uh, i think it, it it aligns very strongly and in different places it, it is either embedded directly or it is a, a key criteria for what is being done so also it's um it's something that many of our staff in the areas that they operate in uh they and they also reflect the same in their personal uh lives as well and that's certainly similar to me um uh i'm i'm a bit of a uh, a green caricature i you know i i vote green i work green i try to live green but i think it's all about being authentic you know to what you do and so and being lucky enough to work with a university i'm able to invest in a a a, a, a habitat which has as many attributes as I can afford. And I, I can't like I can't afford batteries yet. You know, I've still got some work to do. But walking the talk as as uh, in our personal lives, in our professional lives, in our organizational lives, that I think is fundamental to success across all levels. And if if we if if we don't remove the barriers to enable people to transition on a personal and professional level, there will there will still be those systemic failures, uh, because it's got to be affordable. It's got to be for everybody. Uh, it's no good having a look at those those magnificent EV uh, ads on TV if they're like buying a you know a racing car or the you know the the top end. Everything has to be accessible. And um, I think we're on the path to there, uh, but that's still it's still worked, you know, work in progress. So talking about the path, what's next in terms of your sustainability journey for Western? At the moment, uh, our key path is still our carbon transition plan, the decarbonisation, and really fast tracking our fairly high level strategies across our scope one and two and three. Uh, then I think our natural flip is to revisiting our resilience planning and uh, developing that further, uh, which, uh, which is the adaptation side, um, embedding the uh, areas such as uh, water sensitive urban design and the green and the blue, as, as colleagues were talking about yesterday and we had a seminar, um, into our our new emerging campuses and and living spaces, um, and really breaking through those new boundaries. So our you know our treasury and our investment side the, and our ESG that's that's that is very aligned with our smaller world of myself of the operational areas um, across the board social responsibility, whether it is in food services for students, uh, any frontline areas to students have to be a real priority. Uh, and our continuing partnerships. Um, to me, uh, a, uh, a, an important one is looking for our potential carbon generation opportunities at different scales. Um, and, uh, and we we are across the board you know we have very good relationships with uh consultants like yourselves and i think across the sector we and many of our uh traditional consultant groups are seeing that we we want to build longer term uh relationships uh and partnerships again it's not just fee for service but it is developing something um uh far stronger for example, recently uh, uh, from a very significant organization, we received a great offer uh, as an alumni saying we really want to set the path towards net zero to be able to give something back to your students. And I think that's also um, 
probably one of a very important loops to close and and really accentuate, which we we already try, is uh, connecting partnerships with our alumni in business back into contributing to our next generation of students uh, and with our development partners similarly. So we are generating um, campuses of a future in Western Sydney so that there are opportunities in the businesses there for students to learn in practical situations, uh, for look, transitions into jobs in in those those uh, those precincts, and then as they mature, if they are interested, to be able to feed back in as as mentors to the next generation. So um, they're sort of some of the things we're uh, trying to look at. Now we've almost run out of time, but I'm really keen to uh, to get your key takeaway message you want to leave our listeners with. Well, I th I think authenticity is really important. You know, it's really nice to look and learn from what other people are doing, but follow your own normative compass. Do th you know follow the path that looks right for you and your organisation, and just work 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 your way through it step by step. Be ready to, to have those ethically defensible strategies when you know that you're in areas which are open to critique, but it's more important to be a doer than a critic. Uh, and we, you know, and but we also need to be self-reflective and critical and be agile when we can. Take the opportunities when we can, be bold. Uh, but uh, and I, I seriously believe that in leadership, uh, authenticity. Is is very important. Uh, we we do it our way. It's almost like this, an old you know the Australian way, and that's that's what I think uh, reaps benefits. You are such an inspirational leader, Roger. How can people connect with you if they want to find out more or perhaps want to follow you? Um, well, they can certainly contact me here at the university at Western Sydney University. We have we do have a, a an environmental sustainability uh, website. Uh, which uh, you can have a look at many of our environmental sustainability action planning components, our living labs, our strategies, a lot of our strategy documents, such as our resilient planning, are public documents available there. Um, also, it's a challenge to me. I have to, you know, as well as my normal networks, I'm trying to be more uh, active uh, and proactive through uh, professional networks like LinkedIn, uh, I must say with the work-life balance, so I find, I'm finding hard to find time for that one. But um, if anybody ever wants to uh, contact us or follow up, uh, uh, please do. And um, it's, it's, thank you very much, Barbara, for this opportunity, because um, I know how well you, uh, uh, how well connected you are through LinkedIn and those sorts of channels. So I'm sure this will be a great opportunity for, for us and for Western to get some of our messages of what we are proud about and what we want to work with with uh, organisations across the board going forward. You have achieved so much as a university and I'm in awe of all your achievements and I'm so proud to be able to share your story with others because that's the editorial mission of the podcast, to share the stories of uh, organizations that are implementing sustainability and decarbonization successfully in their organization with others so they can learn from it. I really wanted to thank you for your time, Roger, this afternoon. It's been amazing. Thank you. Thank you, Barbara. Likewise, great opportunity. Cheers. That was Dr. Roger Atwater, Senior Manager Environmental Sustainability at Western Sydney University, talking about their journey towards carbon neutrality and net zero emissions. If you know another person who you think would enjoy this podcast, please let them know so that more people can hear about best practice stories of how organizations are moving to net zero emissions. Remember, to reach net zero emissions, aim high, always be curious and act now. Thanks for tuning in and I'll see you in the next episode.